Want to know what the movers and shakers of New Hampshire's performing arts are thinking? Welcome to New Hampshire Unscripted with your host, Ray Dudley. This is Ray Dudley, Artistic Director for Square Peg Productions. And it was about time for me to drop in on my friend Andrew Pernard to see if I could get out of him the current state of the New Hampshire performing arts scene amidst all of this COVID craziness. I knew that Andrew had his ear close to the ground with a lot of politicians and various groups throughout the state. So I needed some information and info he gave me. Take a listen. How are you? How are you doing? Good, good. A little tired today, but not bad. How about you? Hanging in there for this all this madness? Doing my best. Uh, you know, it's challenging um, where there's a lot of work that seems to do little, but is important to do in the long run. But I'm getting outside. I went out and walked for an hour and 20 minutes this morning already just to get out before the heat. I've got a, your Zoom now. I have a, a meeting with a city council meeting of arts advocates from across the state. I'm serving on a steering committee for a loose consortium of groups. Um, Yesterday, I was at the Palace Theater meeting with Peter Ramsey. You know, I've been been very active. None of it is productive financially. I have not made a penny. I'm still on the public dole, so to speak. But unemployment is a strange and unusual thing. So that's a great segue. If you wouldn't mind, if you have the time, can you back up to the like just pre-COVID kind of stuff. And, you know, what was happening at the hat box and life was all roses and unicorns. And then how did you, you must have seen something coming down the road. Things are closing. Take us through the process of then how you, how you decided to get out. And, and I don't know if you jumped on a committee. I don't know if you knew people in politics, but obviously you're one of those people who was prescient enough to see that the arts community needed to be represent, represented. So go through that, and then eventually we'll get into what's happening now. But can you go through that a little bit for me? Sure. Uh, like most organizations that run a September through August season, uh, we were in the thick of planning pitch nights. We were uh, putting together fantasy seasons uh, in preparation for negotiating with the individual production companies to season what would have been our season six. Uh, and still will be our season six, but it's much different than our fantasy football schedule that we had, so to speak. But, you know, we were plugging right along. We had uh, season five at Hatbox, most complicated uh, season. We tried to squeeze in uh, more producers than we've ever squeezed in, uh, and it was working very effectively. We had very good uh, response to the shows. We had very good participation by the production companies, and things were going along pretty hunky-dory. You know, sometime in February, I want to say, early February, we started hearing reports, you know, really filtering through about how the virus may have an impact and things of that nature. But, you know, we started to see it ripple over from Europe. Obviously, we spent time looking at what was happening in Italy and how the performing arts, uh, that was a rather substantial alarm. But, you know, nobody knew at that time, or very few in New Hampshire knew what the scale of it was going to be. And so... In late February, I think late February, I had a conversation with the owners of the property that we rent. Well, I've had a, their management. And theoretically, if the government shut down the facilities, how that was going to impact us financially, whether we would have to pay our rent while we were closed. And at the time, I was assured, oh, it'll be a force majeure situation and you won't have to pay anything. You'll be. F-. And then, you know, three and a half weeks later, or four weeks later, when the governor shut us down and shut everybody down uh, for entirely justified reasons, I went back to the mall management and said, so what do we do now? And he said, well, you should talk to your insurance company um, because the promises they made a month before or three weeks or a month before, they conveniently forgot the conversations that we had and they wanted us to look different directions. So, you know, we... We knew right out of the gate that, you know, we were going to have to make substantial adjustments to our schedule, to our season, in order to be safe for artists and audiences. And I immediately started paying attention. Uh, The task force was uh, started, the governor's task force was established, and I started listening uh, to those because I wanted to see what it would mean to reopen. We made several plans 
I think we had three different uh, dates that we hoped to reopen. We closed one production and said, well, we'll hold it off and maybe we can postpone for a month or two months. And we went through three iterations of rescheduling productions. Eventually, we realized that wasn't going to happen. We weren't going to reschedule and we had... 39 Steps canceled. I canceled my production of SOFA, the Symposium of Forgotten Arts, which was going to be a conference. I figured I would not reapply for that at Hatbox, where we have a, you know, a model where production companies, you know, get pitched, uh, pitched to the production, uh, to the pitch review team. And those folks uh, then program a season. And I figured, you know, we have production companies who have been longstanding I would rather have them be rescheduled and get onto the season rather than have SOFA, which can happen anytime and anywhere, uh, take place. So, you know, we postponed Copenhagen, we postponed Metamorphoses, we postponed the dinner party. We were in rehearsals, uh, virtual rehearsals, but rehearsals for Man of La Mancha, which tonight would have been their dress rehearsal. Wow. Tomorrow night they would have been opening. Um, the... Uh, it, you know, we were optimistic. All of us were optimistic. We were hopeful that we'd be able to just immediately start back up again. But, you know, while I was uh, continuing to project optimism and trying to create scenarios where we would be able to reopen whenever, um, the, uh, the process was interesting. I watched the task force and listened to their meetings. Um, they had uh, phone in meetings and, you know, when different industries were trying to uh, step up and reopen as quickly as possible, I noticed very early on that they were all professional associations that were developing the guidelines and then handing them off to the task force who essentially, um, approved them with very minor changes. Mm. And I realized early on, wow, we're going to be the last to open, not just because we're challenging spaces, yeah. but because we don't have an industry association with you know paid staff whose whole job is to advocate for the arts at the statewide level. And I have been active and involved um, with the State Council on the Arts even though I'm Hatbox Theaters and LLC, not a not-for-profit, we don't get any funding from the public. People contribute on their own through memberships or advertisements. Um, we don't get grant money. We don't get operating fund support. But I've tried to maintain a very close relationship with the State Arts Council because I think it's important for us to advocate for one another, and which is the reason I go and see uh, everybody else's show. I have a lot of uh, the Hatbox community has been embraced by the uh, performing arts community in the state as a whole. And we have a lot of people coming through our doors uh, doing work in our space. So, you know, even you know when we started, I made a, a pointed effort to go and see shows as often as I could of people who had worked in the Hatbox when they're performing elsewhere, because that that community supporting itself is so important. Right. And so I realized that with the task force not having that, um, we were going to have a problem. So I called Ginny Loopy and I was talking with Neil Pankhurst at the time. And we were having conversations about how we're going to be left high and dry because we have no voice. We weren't at the table. So I organized, worked with Ginny Loopy and wrote some um, some copy uh, to email to, I think I emailed like 50 or 60 organizations to say, can we get a meeting to talk about how we're going to respond to this and how we're going to step up and advocate for ourselves? And we had a very good turnout. We had like 45 show up. This was before we really got serious about it. Were these theater Ginny, groups? I don't mean to interrupt. Were they theater groups or were they? Mostly performing arts or presenting okay. arts venues. Okay. So it was mostly, um, it was focused on the venues because we were immediately impacted. The groups that use the venues are also going to be impacted, but some of them might not be impacted for months or years, depending on what their schedule was. So we had this wonderful meeting. I wrote this letter, uh, and it was emailed out. And what was interesting is that language that I wrote ended up in a speech um, before the task force. I didn't know it was happening, but I was happy. Nikki Clark from the Capital Center for the Arts uh, stood up for the organization. She was asked by the commissioner, um, Taylor Caswell, to speak before the task force as a representative of the performing arts organizations. And she was, um, she admitted to the committee, and you can listen to the recording still online, she admitted to the committee how uncomfortable she was trying to represent other organizations that she wasn't directly involved with. And so as a result, 
uh, Joe Gleason, who's the assistant executive director, Nikki Clark, myself, Neil Pankhurst, uh, Peter Ramsey from the Palace Theater, Matt Cahoon from Theater Kapow and the Stockbridge Theater in, in Pinkerton Academy, um, you know, the, the artistic executive director from uh, Andy Summer Playhouse, a number of these groups who had summer seasons to deal with, um, we got together and started uh, an ad hoc organization. And Ginny Lupi was very, very involved with it from the State Arts Council in facilitating those meetings. And we worked with um, Shannon Chandley, uh, Senator, State Senator Shannon Chandley, who uh, helped, you know, to uh, every meeting of this group to help guide us through the process of developing uh, the guidelines. Uh, Joe Gleason helped write up the guidelines in a format and gave us a starting document to work with. And uh, then we met weekly, sometimes twice or three times a week, uh, for well over a month, probably closer to two months. It's all blurring nowadays. And that work was broken up further into five subgroups. And the subgroups were performing arts venues, organizations, fairs and festivals, museums, and uh, arts and education. And these were four groups that were not being advocated. And so we worked very hard. I served on three of those subgroups. Uh, and often my role was facilitating um, by literally I would share a document uh, in Zoom and then I would ask questions uh, and we would adopt uh, comments or suggestions one step at a time. And then we would pass that document back out to people and they would put comments along the side in the Google format kind of a thing. Uh, and then our next meeting, I would just talk people through all those comments and then we, you know, tried to refine it. And Can then I'll I stop you for a second. Sure. So, um, what was the response you were getting? Were you, were, was, was it inviting? What was it, uh, tentative? I mean, as time's moving on, money's being handed out supposedly, or, or, you know, and so you're under crunch time. Were you getting any feedback like, Oh, come on, really? You guys are just performers. We, this is not necessary. What was going on there? We, we were, uh, they were very pleased to have us. Uh, the reason for that is, you know, at the state level, Laws that are written while they're sponsored by legislators a lot of the laws are written and this happens at the national level as well are written by advocates or lobbyists or whatever so a lot of the the work that goes into the process of of developing laws comes from people advocating from their specific position mm -hmm. and so i think that they were they it wasn't that they um weren't working for us, but they weren't working in our area because there was nobody stepping up to pressure them to work in our area. And again, if you listen to the recordings, and there are dozens and dozens of hours of these recordings now, maybe over a hundred hours, um, they were grateful that we, I haven't seen an effort like this in, um, in my entire time. What happened as a result of this is we had lots of organizations who, for what didn't talk to one another. Right. Maybe they were too busy working in their own area. Maybe they were a regional entity and they weren't, um, uh, they, they, they felt that people working in another region didn't impact them. So they just, they hunkered down. They did uh, work that was in their mission, but they were kind of had their blinders on even sure. companies in the same community. Um, either didn't talk or wouldn't directly support one another's efforts. It's not like they were working against one another, but let's face it, most arts administrators and uh, especially in volunteer groups, you know, you have limited amount of time to do this. So you stay focused on what's really important and what's sudden. We all realized that we were going to miss out. We were going to be forgotten, and lots of arts organizations were going to close and may still close. There are several that have already closed. Um, I drove by Jupiter Hall in Manchester yesterday, and there's a for lease sign in the window. You know, that's an organization that did a bunch of, pr you know, programming that vanished without a trace. And I'm assuming that it's COVID related. Uh, I don't know anymore, but COVID just. Uh, I think this whole pandemic response and how we're, how it affects us all financially uh, is going to exacerbate 
challenges that organizations may have already had. So some organizations that might have been able to limp along three or four more years without before closing because they haven't had the support or whatever yeah. are closing now because it's it's crunch time. But, you know, again, what's come out of this, if we can maintain the momentum, is a large group of people who are really interested in supporting one another and finding ways to advocate at the state house. Uh, for arts. Uh, there is an arts organization that has been around for about 20 years called Arts for NH that used to be Citizens for the Arts 1000 or there were a variety of names. And they were a very well-meaning and active group of um, interested citizens who wanted to advocate for the arts, but they weren't necessarily practitioners. They weren't the people, the, the talks weren't driven by the people who were doing the work on the ground. Mm -hmm. and therefore, the advocacy level was arts are nice, arts are swell, we should support the arts. But there wasn't any, here's a challenge we have right now, how can we address it? Um, you know, and so there have been discussions. In fact, we have a, a, a steering committee meeting today at one o'clock, a steering committee of a loose consortium of organizations to discuss uh, how to move forward and whether we want to start our own organization or whether we want to join another organization like Arts for NH and try to support the mission that they're supposedly already doing, but now they're going to have a fire under their hiney, so to speak, you yeah. know, because the organizations who are getting involved expect results. I think they've been working, you know, out of best interest, but with no real, uh, no real, causation you know nothing bad is going to happen if they do it nothing bad is going to happen if they don't do it yeah. well now there's lots of things we had as part of my work with the steering committee we wrote a letter to the governor and we had it hand delivered by a, a, a gentleman who uh, is a developer here in concord and very connected to the art scene and a, a friend of the governor and we spent over a week working on this and i personally was in contact with over 108 <clears throat> organizations trying to get them to sign this letter. And we got most of the only one group declined to sign it and they didn't sign it not because they didn't support it, but they didn't sign it because they didn't have time to get their board together to discuss it, to approve it so that they could sign it. I mean, you know, boards often are slow moving entities yeah. and that's great for lots of reasons. Uh, but we couldn't afford slow right now. We still can't afford slow. Right. Um, that, letter went to the governor and we asked for a sit down meeting so we could describe the challenges that are in front of us. We asked for more money uh, in this letter, almost uh, over $23 million is anticipated being lost just by the hundred or so organizations that signed this letter through December. And that's not including, that's just their individual organization's loss. That's not including the, the ancillary effect. When you buy a doll, a ticket, you know, a dollar uh, of your ticket price you can multiply that generally by 17 is the number that is expected of the impact elsewhere. So if you multiply $23 million by 17, you yeah. get a sense that we're talking real money. Right. Um, because and, these are all the, um, the, the add on like uh, restaurants and yep, hotels, dinner, lodging, yeah. you know, uh, drinks after there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, economic activity that's associated with this. And the reason why this gentleman, Steve Dupree of Concord, uh, a large real estate developer in town, he was instrumental in helping the bank of New Hampshire stage happen. And he serves uh, as the chairman of the board currently on the career uh, museum. Um, he's in lodging. And so anything that stimulates, um, people, move, you know, staying in a hotel is good for his business. Yeah. So he's been a very shrewd and very good advocate for the arts because what's good for the arts is good for his businesses. Mm -hmm. And so he's a very good ally for the arts in the state of New Hampshire, particularly in the regions where he has logic, you know, the Concord and he's looking into Manchester more and more to expand his market because there's only so much you can do. But, you know, I'm on the creative Concord committee, which is a small uh, committee for the Chamber of Commerce, and Steve is on that committee, and a number of other groups. Uh, Nikki Clark is is on that committee, and and other folks. Um, and you know, most of the focus in Concord was talking about you know what's going to happen in the long range. And Steve reported to us that it's they're not expected to get back to twenty five percent of their lodging numbers by next June. So 25%. 
25% was a number he shot out a month and a half or two months ago. Wow. They're not projecting getting back to 25% of normal lodging until June of 2021, whatever year, next wow. year. So, you know, this is, everybody's hit by this. Right. Um, the arts are particularly hit because we have a very strange dynamic. You know, we have a lot of people packed in tightly together for a long period of time. And in indoor settings where ventilation may not be, uh, it may not circulate as much fresh air in and out of the space as needed. Mm -hmm. And so there are significant health concerns. But what's fascinating to us, and I created a document and worked with Ginny Loopy for about two and a half hours, reconciling when they came out with the the guidelines, which the process was we wrote guidelines, we submitted them, the task force approved them, then they went to Health and Human Services, and Health and Human Services reviewed them, made modifications, and then that modified document went to the governor to sign. Well, none of those modifications ever came back to this group for us to go, wait, this makes no sense, this won't work. And so once the guidelines came out, we immediately had to spend another week going through the guidelines and coming up with a document. Now, this is a I don't know how well you can see it. This is a three-page document just looking at the discrepancies. <laughs> and so we sent it off to the task force, who then sent it off to Health and Human Services. And one of the documents, the Safer at Home Performing Arts Venues document, came out on June 18th. And I've been waiting to have somebody let us know that it changed. Well, they sent, they updated a new document on July 2nd, and nobody knew actually had been released so and the new document is now six pages or seven pages instead of the four that we had before and nobody's had a chance to go through that so okay. it it's a uh you know people are doing the best they can they're so yeah good so. so when you first started what were you hoping to get we, uh, we just to seat at the table did you want to, uh, financial help did you just uh, were there mechanical things you needed? What, what were you hoping to get when, when you, when the organ, your organization, whatever that you called it or the group came in, what, what was, you just trying to stem some bleeding? What, what was going on? Well, there were, there were a number of factors at play. Number one, um, the summer stock theaters all had to try to figure out what they were going to do, whether or not they were going to be reopened. So first and foremost, we wanted information. Mm -hmm. We wanted somebody to, be directly contacting us and saying, you know, maybe we can't tell the public this yet, but we can tell you that health and human services are looking in these areas. And we think that we're not going to deal with your area. We're not even going to consider reopening you until such and such a date. Um, when they started talking about the phased in plans, I asked, I, I asked the question of the task force and said, so who is setting the, the timeline? And their argument was, well, the, the virus is setting the timeline. We're, uh, we're just responding to the safety and the data and the metrics. And, and, and that is, a, is, an, is an accurate and honest answer, but it's not an answer. Because right. there's lots of other things that they need to do, and they're all developing scenarios. They're sitting down on a whiteboard going, here's what organizations we think can reopen first. Here's our essential organizations. Here's all the organizations we shut down. So we just wanted a timeline. Let us know what we're going to need to do to plan in the interim. I mean, these summer stock theaters had hired people. Um, they were going to be traveling to our state, and they were going to be doing this work. We couldn't get information at all. And as a result, even through the process, once we started the process of help of working together to create the guidelines, we only had an hour, less than an hour, uh, to talk with H with Health and Human Services, we came up with a list of questions, and that list of questions was reduced to a tiny list of questions, and we got some information. But at that point, virtually every summer, summer stock theater had shuttered their doors for the summer. Right. They looked at the writing on the wall, and they had to make a determination before they actually got information from the government. The people who are controlling the information aren't weren't providing it at the time. Shocking. That goes. And I don't want to, you know, know. There, there are a lot of people within government who are civil servants who are working very hard, who have access to the information. And I think there are lots of people on both sides of the aisle who have the best interest of our communities. Yep. But there, you know, my big frustration is that we didn't see the guidelines until the governor 
had a press conference and say, they can open June 29th, and here's the guidelines. Well, that gave us two weeks or something to respond, uh, and yet we had never seen the paperwork since we put it in. We waited almost three weeks, maybe a month, before we actually found out what was in that documentation. There was no communication after it had been approved. Hmm. So, um, you know, first was information. Second was funding, because if they could provide us with information to say how long we think you're going to be closed for, then we can get a realistic sense of how much money are we going to need to be able to stay open? What can, what should we do? How should we not be spending our time? How What sort of money should we not be doing? Should we not be advertising for shows that aren't going to happen? You know, there are organizations who were spending money on fruitless pursuits. Uh, and so... We wanted a seat at the table as far as an option to, to help shape how the reopening funds and the CARES money was spent. So we asked for money on that end. Um, not-for-profits were given several options to apply for money, and several, lots of them got money. Um, not nearly enough, especially considering we closed first, and we're going to be the last to reopen. There are lots of organizations that aren't going to open until January of next year. Um, and for... You know, some of us pay mortgages, some of us yeah. pay rent, some of us pay storage facilities, some of us have employees, you yeah. know, Hatbox has no employees, which was great because we're, we didn't have to apply for PPP funds, but because we had no employees, we couldn't apply for PPP funds, which could also be spent on rent. So then I went and applied for funds to the Main Street program because Hatbox is an LLC, well, because I'm also self-employed, they denied us because I'm self-employed and because Hatbox is an LLC. Supposedly, I'm making a lot of money off of Hatbox. Oh, yeah, I'm, making, I'm, sure. I'm not making any money from Hatbox. In fact, I'm out of pocket every year paying taxes for Hatbox. Uh, and I work 30 to 60 hours a week for free and have for five years now. Uh, and yet, this, you know, local government wants us to, uh, you know, pay license fees. Right. They want us to, you know, they're backdating things so that even though we've been closed for four months now, um, we just had a fire inspection. And I asked, can you date that from today? So we at least are doing it from today and get a year from now. And they backdated it to March 31st. We've been open for four months. So I'm paying money towards an inspection to a, for a facility that we haven't didn't open and had nobody in. So, huh. I mean, and, and trying to get local government to respond in a responsible way. It, it's just, it's, it's been very challenging. The other aspect, the, the final part of your question, I think is also the continued ask that if government is going to keep us closed or government is going to provide guidelines that require us to, to maintain this capacity, mm -hmm. and yet our overhead is this much, they can't expect us to reopen, and they right. can't expect the public to reopen, and because they're the ones who are monkeying, I mean, yes, the pandemic, the uh, virus itself is what's right. causing the challenge, but government regulations are what's really shutting us down and not letting us do our job. In the document that I just held up, um, I came up with a spreadsheet that looked at what they're doing in restaurants. In restaurants that are allowed to have indoor seating, they can have, conceivably, a, a restaurant might have 100 seats that they can seat. None of those people have to wear masks, and yet the servers do. So in my spreadsheet, 100 people wearing you know, sitting, eating with no masks and talking, and only 10 people wearing masks is 9% of the population in that enclosed space that are protected by masks. Mm -hmm. In a theater where we're going to require a hundred people to wear masks and only the five performers on stage are not going to wear masks and everybody else is that's 105 people not uh, wearing masks and five not. And that 105 people aren't talking. They're sitting quietly. So we've great point percent coverage and yet performing arts venues have a greater uh, have greater restrictions on what we can do than restaurants. And that's a huge discrepancy, yeah. a huge discrepancy. And, and that does not uh, give me great confidence when a politician says, oh, everything we're doing is based on science. Well, if that's the case, there should be a much closer you know, resolution between the two. So if you're going to put these increased restrictions on us, you also have to help us at a better rate than banks. 
A bank can close. Their employees can work from home. Right. You can do online banking. A performing arts venue, that's not the way it works. You can do streaming, but streaming is not a replacement for live entertainment, and it doesn't replace the overhead associated with the facilities being closed. Mm -hmm. We can't even really close the facilities yet because there's no one to do that. There's nobody to negotiate. um, So, you know, we are asking for increased funding and we're lobbying at the state level, we're lobbying at the local level, we're lobbying at the federal level for more funding for the state. Now, realistically, the amount of time that I'm putting into this uh, there's lots of people who are get, who are salaried that are doing this, and it's part of their job to do this. I'm not. I'm doing this because I know that Hatbox will could have to close if there's not funds available mm-hmm. and close forever. And there are other smaller not-for-profits who may have to close and close forever because they are not seen as um, as important to the overall cultural landscape. And my constant argument has been, and you and I have talked about this in the past, is that you know 80% of the funding goes to 10% of the venues right. because they're the big ones. They're the ones that everybody hears, everybody knows about, and everybody wants to be associated with. But from an economic driver perspective, the 80% of small venues do collectively more uh, they they right. are, have more impact financially and on more communities, not just the communities that they reside in because they're spread out amongst the state, than the big ones. So we need as, a, uh, as citizens, we need as a government to really look at the arts, the performing arts, the presenting arts, the cultural institutions in our state, and take a hard look and understand what's going to be lost and decide whether or not we want to be supporting, um, you know, because when you live, they finally put out the list of organizations that got money. uh, And yet the only ones they actually told dollar amounts were the small ones. They didn't want people to know how much (laughs) money the big ones got, which they're, you know, they're talking transparency. That's not transparent, you know, and, and I want to know if a large organization, if um, I, and I, I'm, only bringing this up as an example, uh, if churches, the Catholic Church or whatever, if they got PPP money in a greater percentage than a cultural organization, why? Right. If a resort community affiliated with a politician received a larger amount of PPE or funding from the CARES funds and things of that nature, we want to know about that. Yeah, why aren't municipalities do. getting money? You know. Um, yeah. Uh, again, I, I don't want to point fingers at people, but I do want to, you know, put shine the light on um, inequities within the system. So mm-hmm. our whole purpose right now, if we can stay to it and if we can, if we aren't swept away by a tidal wave of, you know, the really impressing, uh, really important pressing matters of just survival for the organization. If we can continue to work as a group to advocate for ourselves, I'm hoping that our the communities will step up and support, and our the funding that we receive will be equitably factored in compared to what the banks are receiving. Yeah, you know, stuff yeah. like that. I agree. So, how devastating has it been? How, have, have we lost many groups? What What's the current casualty list? Well, again, $23 million plus on 100 organizations. Yeah. Um, hundreds of jobs. There have been lots of jobs that have been furloughed. Um, I, was, I have lost as a performer. You know, I make my living performing, doing shows. I have two shows scheduled for the rest of the year. The rest of the year. And those were discounted shows that I booked as a block booking of four shows, two of which were canceled. So, you know, I was giving them a, a, a better rate because they were booking four shows in a similar region. This, these were all in Vermont, actually. They weren't even in New Hampshire. Um, I have one other date that's on the books. Um, I was supposed to perform at the Palace Theater in their spotlight room back in March. That got canceled. It was March 21st. We closed the 16th. So the Saturday after Hatbox closed, everybody else was closed too because the governor shut everybody down. Right. And we rescheduled it for September. Well, I found out yesterday that the woman who booked me, who was in charge of booking uh, events for this room, had rescheduled me. But she's no longer at the palace because she was furloughed with the rest of the employees. Oh. So, again, 
we don't know the full consequences of this because the people who do the work aren't there anymore. I mean, the Capital Center for the Arts, I, I'm, I'm pleased to report that they still have seven employees um, out of, you know, 40 something, I think they said, or maybe up to 200, including the part-time employees that, you know, bartenders, wait staff, things of that nature, they're different venues, bar keeps, things of that nature. Um, they're down to seven and that seven happen to be the big ones, the executive director, assistant executive director, the development person, the assistant development person, uh, a facilities person, you know, the people that really need to, that you can't get rid of yet. But if they run out of money in ju- the end of July, it's going to get down to one. I heard a, 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 a read an article in the Concord Monitor yesterday, maybe even this morning, I've lost track. Uh, about Red River Theaters, which had a th- had a staff of uh, three full time employees and a bunch of part timers, and right now there's only one full time employee at Red River Theaters, and that's the executive director. And one person is not enough to be able to reopen the place. And once people are gone, if they're gone a certain amount of time, they go looking for other work because they sure. have to. Right. So there's a good possibility that the ripple effects of this. Um, is going to be devastating to the cultural community in the state of New Hampshire for years, years to come. So are you bumping up against any deadlines now? Uh, what, where are we as far as like stage of opening and all of that stuff? Well, we're all, and I think this is another great thing to come out of this. I just worked with Matt Cahoon yesterday. He was in Connecticut and I was in New Hampshire. And we worked on a list of talking points for organizations to respond to public requests. And one of the concerns that we have is that everybody is, um, we're aligning one another, one another's operations and trying to do things in a, in an industry specific manner. Like most of us are requiring mask use. Uh, Whereas the governor says, no, that he's not requiring mask use for us to survive and for us to have the public confidence for people to return, we're requiring it. And I don't know of any place in the state uh, for the performing arts that are not requiring it. However, every organization is going to reopen at a different time based on how their business operates and what challenges they have in front of them. Hatbox can reopen because our overhead is pretty low. And even though we seat 100, we're only going to be able to seat between 20 and 35 people for performances spaced out. We've moved seats back. We're requiring masks. We're, you know, we're, we're doing all of the things that are in the guidelines and more what are in the guidelines, but big places like the capital center for the arts presenting houses that bring in touring artists. There are no artists touring, right? Because yeah. they can't make it work financially to tour. And until they get to a point where they can, they have nothing to sell. Half box is producing is, is local productions locally produced. The, uh, they are doing some work at the bank of New Hampshire stage and they've opened already a series of concerts in an outdoor park with limited seating up to 50 people in outdoor seating um, that I'm sure they're not making any money at. They're doing it to keep their organization in the eyes of the public and provide a service. Um, you know, you can only box, do that for so long. I mean, that's, exactly. a, that's a financial drain. Yeah, I, I was there, uh, the Palace Theater. I sat down with Peter Ramsey yesterday, and they had just done a matinee production of Beauty and the Beast, mm-hmm. and they had 70 people in a space that seats 700 or so. And so, you know, the cost to clean the facility yeah. after you've had 70 people in are probably half of your ticket price, what you've gotten for ticket revenue. Again, they're losing money. They have a group of supporters who are helping to make sure that they don't lose too much money. But, you know, uh, a lot of us are struggling with ways to be able to provide the public um, an opportunity to get away from all of the terrible stuff around them right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's affecting programming decisions. You know, at Hatbox, we had, we were going to do Man of La Mancha and, you know, we were going to open it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And it would have been a perfect show for the challenges that are happening now. It's a little dark. It's very sad um, at one point, but at the end, it's hopeful. And we need hope right now. Um, We postponed it to July of next year uh, and it's going to be just as needed then because we just can't do it. Now we're looking at our season six and trying to program stuff that are not heavy, not dark, but some escapist. 
You know, we need to do things to keep people's spirits up. Yes, we need to tell stories that will move people. But our hope is, is that they walk out of the theater feeling lighter than when they came in. Nice. And so that will also have an impact on, you know, that that's also, frankly, a, a financial decision. Because who's going to come and who's going to want to come and see a, a yeah. play about the plague when they're living it? You know, I mean, you could do a, a Camus, you could do the plague, um, but why would you? And if nobody shows up, you're doing yourself and, and your audience is a disservice. So I, I don't know how it's all going to shake out. I do know that I'm working very hard and I am, I am very grateful for a large uh, group of colleagues within the art world and the cultural world in the state of New Hampshire who are being incredibly creative, who are working extra hard. They're not paid well to begin with, and they're working way over time to try to do everything they can to reopen safely and to provide a, a sense of normalcy uh, for people in the Granite State. Um, so are you optimistic hard. here? Are you Are you feeling like uh things are going to uh maybe in the short term maybe open up a bit and and, and things can begin to go oh, what stage are we at in the state don't they have like three stages four stages or something like that that yeah they don't really um okay they talk about it reopening as phase one phase two phase three but they're all out of alignment so you have phase one in restaurants and phase one in theaters is over here and phase one in campgrounds is here and none of them are vertically aligned so phases don't mean anything yeah. in fact i asked that question at one of the early task force meetings and they were like uh oh well it's the federal government you know it's to go look at this and i went and look at trump's uh phased approach to reopening uh and that was kind of an initial ground plan but pretty much every state is doing it their own way uh, the state of Massachusetts is doing a remarkable way. They're, they've been providing a lot of additional details um, that help their organizations make decisions um, in ways that I wish New Hampshire had. Uh, we've had to, to lead from the ground up rather than from the top down. I have to give our governor a lot of credit. He has, he has uh, tried to walk a very fine balance in, in trusting the good nature and uh, goodwill of his population um, and not being too restrictive, but also being very cautious. He has been pretty conservative about reopening and he's, his messaging has been pretty good about please don't show up. I, I think that that crack, cracks are showing. And I think the fact that we have no mechanism in this state to hold organizations accountable for when they fail to follow the guidelines. Maine, I have a buddy in, up in Falmouth, uh, Maine, who runs a little 75-seat theater, who has done a lot of work in the state of New Hampshire. I first met him working at Gene's Playhouse. Well, it was North Country Center for the Arts up in Lincoln. And, uh, you know, they have a very rigorous set of guidelines that they have to follow. And they have people coming around to check to make sure that you're following it. And if you're not, there's the potential of a fine. Uh -huh. So they're taking it very, very seriously. And they want people to, they're, they're supporting that. We're not doing that. We've been essentially told in this state, here are the guidelines. We hope you do it and good luck. And then early on in the process, we were also told the governor announced any organization affected by COVID would be able to get free PPE right. when they reopen. That's not happening anymore. They're sold at the liquor stores. Um, and organizations like the performing arts who have been closed all this time have not, do not have access to that anymore because either they ran out or they didn't have the money or they didn't understand the demand or, you know, I, again, there were a lot of early promises that were promises for a very short window that have gone away. And so uh, those of us who have been waiting going, okay, now we can reopen. You're saying we can reopen, but all of the support you gave others is no longer available. So, you know, as to your question, I am very optimistic. I find uh, one of the things I like to tell other artists or, or when I'm directing a play or, or working with young uh, people is that the best art comes out of limitations. They come out of constraint. 
They come out of frustration. They come out of anger, fear, sadness, things that motivate people to do great work. So we are going to see really great work come out of this. Um, I think we're going to, we're likely to see a pandemic shift in how organizations do the business of art. I, I think Hatbox was on, uh, you know, the forefront of it, well, a forefront, another forefront, when Psaki Playoffs started small. M&D Productions, which just celebrated 20 years, started out small in a mall. Uh, and those intimate experiences, even when the Winnipesaukee Playhouse grew, they grew to a 300-seat three, venue, not a 1,000-seat venue, right. not a 1,500-seat venue. And I think what we're going to see, you know, I'm, I'm excited that the Colonial Theater in Laconia is being renovated, but I'm very concerned that they're not going to survive and they're going to get cut back up into apartments at some point because they can't afford to stay open because they aren't going to have the touring. So I don't know. Long range, uh, people are getting used to being home. People are used to cooking for themselves. They're not going to go out to restaurants as frequently. They don't have the money to go out as frequently. Um, people aren't going to go. They get, they're consuming their art through big screen TVs at home. You know, I think we're going to need to find ways to reconnect and reinvigorate and to develop trust and confidence in our audiences that not only is it safe to come back, but you need to come back because you've lost something by sitting behind your screens yeah. or sitting in your couch watching television. Well, what point um, does things just break and, and you, there is no company. It, there's all that's left is just debris of theaters. If, if things don't move at some point, we just can't keep saying, well, three months from now, we'll see if we can reopen six months from now. We'll see if we, because along the way, these groups just are going to start dropping off. Right. I mean, uh, I've been, it's funny because I have a tendency to be either a pessimistic optimist or an optimistic pessimist. <laughs> I often look at the challenges first because I want to look at how we can solve the solutions and to determine whether or not we have enough resources or whether instead of banging our head against this wall, maybe there's another direction that we can go. Yeah. And so once again, creativity comes out of constraint, but I've been thinking of the arts more and more, especially with my work at Hatbox, about gar- about being the process of gardening. That you are, when you plant a garden, you can plant beans this year, you can plant beans next year, you can plant beans the year after, but what happens is the soil becomes, it, it, it loses the appropriate nutrients for that crop. Right. So a good farmer, a good gardener, knows that you shouldn't always plant the same crop in the same place every year, Mm -hmm. that you need to replace the nutrients that will do best for that crop. Cause eventually you'll just kill the field. Right. And you have to, you have to fertilize it periodically. You have to prepare it. And I think you also, in some ways you have to let stuff die in order to grow new and better crops. And so well, I'm very optimistic that we're going to have a lot of really cool things come out of this, we're going to see a, a, a new group, a younger group of performers and creators who are looking for new creative outlets that might not have been involved with the theater. Mm-hmm. I hate to say this, but you're also going to see a lot of um, legacy producers, legacy artists, legacy performers who are never going to feel comfortable about standing on stage again. That yeah. there are people who... I can't do community theater anymore because I'm at risk. I, my family is at risk. Um, And the risk is not worth the reward. And some of these people have probably, because they've been so good and done such great work over the years and they're so connected into the community, but they haven't left room for new artists to come in Hmm. that this may be, I hate to say it. This is like, um, you know, the Native Americans used to start forest fires as a way of keeping the landscape accessible for the animals that they hunted. Interesting. I didn't know that. It's about clearing the space. And they were, they were controlled fires, so they wouldn't burn the legacy trees, but they would burn the low brush. Huh. You know, and even today, we do that in regular forest fire management in the, in the the western part of the United States. That's more about 
protecting property, but I think the same is true that every once in a while you got to clear house and provide new opportunities. And one of the strange things is, is Hatbox benefited from um, the opportunity of a mall that was dying, an empty space. And we were able to get it at a reduced rate and do some incredible work in that space because we weren't working in a large venue that we had to pay a lot of money on. Mm -hmm. Some of the groups that work in Hatbox um, rent large venues for their shows and they're not, they canceled their shows through the end of this year. And they're not certain that they're going to do another show until fall of 2021 in the bigger spaces. So they're looking for the smaller venues as a way to, to do what they love to do and what audiences want to see at a scale that they can. Mm -hmm. And so I think what's weird about this is we're going to see a lot of properties open up. We're going to see a lot of companies, not just theater companies, but, you know, small mom and pop stores or retail stores or whatever close and create an opportunity for redevelopment of those spaces. And I think that, you know, the first people to move in are probably going to be the artists because they see, hey, we can get this for cheap. Let's do this. We, this is something we are passionate about and driven to do. That it, it's been this pattern has been repeated again and again and again. You look at Portsmouth. Portsmouth became an amazing and vital community because of the shipping. You know the the sea coast uh, and ultimately the naval yard and the air force base and things of that nature. But people didn't want to live there until the theaters started building in the late sixties, early seventies. And now they're at a point where the all of what made Portsmouth beautiful and great, the quirkiness, the weird little shops, the things of that nature, they're getting priced out of town by the people who want to live there, but they don't like the noise. <laughs> or they don't like the commotion. And that process of gentrification, pushing things out until people don't want to live there anymore. And then the property values collapse because the taxes are so high. And then there's another opportunity in 30 years. It's a, it's a continual yeah. cycle. Yeah. I, I am very optimistic that we are going to come out of this, not all of us. And it's going to change for a very long time, how people experience live entertainment, live art, live culture, um, but I'm very hopeful that it will spur on new growth that people, because you can't do the Rogers and Hammerstein musicals. You can't mm -hmm. do the, those that people are going to want to create small scale musicals that can comply with the guidelines. You know, there's mm -hmm. there, the biggest challenge we have is we can't stage any musical because there's a 25 foot setback. <laughs> I don't have 25 foot <laughs> setback on the front. Row. There's no such thing as a 25 foot setback. in our well, That's a truth. The Palace Theater, they can certainly handle a 25-foot setback, but for a room full of 70 people, um, I have a, a – there's a couple groups that have already put out a survey, and we're preparing to send a survey out hopefully this week. Um, it's, it's all written. I just haven't sent it yet. Um, that asks audiences uh, how they expect to return. Do they expect to see more, less, uh, the same – shows will they come out to more shows and what types of shows are they going to want to see yeah you know what do they feel comfortable doing what do we need to do as organizations to make them feel comfortable or to enable them to feel comfortable enough to come back and see these kind of things and again we may look at a hybrid model um we may try to see more original works because we can't afford to to pay license fees for something we may not have enough people but if we create original work Right. That would be a huge, huge renaissance. Yeah. Amazing new works coming out of this. Yeah. I was talking early on in this uh, with a friend of mine, and I was saying how, you know, we, in, in, as humans, we, we have this theory of evolution and how the strong survive and, and uh, the weak get weeded out and then things continue on. And this is a very classic case of living through evolution because mm -hmm. weaker substances weaker companies weaker organizations weaker whatever are not going to make it and what ends up happening is there's a vacuum that vacuum will be filled by the innovators the 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 people who are the creators this is this is a wonderful time for folks who who think outside the box so to speak and and can see what's happening and and, and rush in to fill those voids 
so I'm really happy for I'm not happy, but I'm I'm excited to see the next evolution, the next generation of what can come out of this kind of a thing. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think the biggest challenge is not knowing. Right. That it's hard to make plans when you have no sense of when this is going to end. And, you know, I have a daughter who's in college. She's about to go into her junior year of college, and she's not studying theater. She's studying marine biology and oceanography and, you know, things that are going to have an impact on our world outside of our little creative community. Um, However, I think of the thousands and thousands, the tens of thousands of theater majors, of music majors, of, you know, these people who uh, aspire the film you know, they're in film school, Mm -hmm. you know, that right now we were in an unprecedented time of being able to get your work in front of eyes because you can make a movie in your backyard and immediately have it screened and have thousands of people see it. Right. Now the financial model behind that doesn't necessarily support it in the same way. It costs a lot of money to make a good film. And, you know, how do you get that money? How do you get your return on your investment? But for the students, you know, or the backstage people. I look at Broadway. I look at Hamilton. Somebody posted a meme the other day. I think it's great that everybody gets to see it on Disney plus, but it would be great if you sat and watched the eight minutes of credits at the end that details every person that was involved in doing not just the onstage work, but making the onstage part possible. Mm -hmm. And every one of them are out of work with no prospects for the future. I mean it. And so it's, and that's commercial theater. So right. They did that to make money. So for the not-for-profits who oftentimes feel, they don't feel comfortable ever. I think not-for-profit theaters in general are always on a feast and famine schedule. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, something happened that a lot of people are giving us money right now. And then they get to moments where, oh, we don't have enough money, but we can always ask for more money. You know, when it comes to the, the, the that works really well for your established organizations or for brand new organizations but for the groups that have been around a little bit people assume that they're doing well just like every person you know like i look at social media i look at facebook and you know facebook has been proven through many studies to actually have a diminished uh capacity uh for engendering good mental health in people because you end up competing with the idealized version that people are curating of themselves online yeah. And so people go online, they compare themselves. Well, I don't have that nice a house. I don't have that nice a job. I'm not that happy. Uh, so I must be miserable. And it really, everybody's miserable. It's just how we respond to it. And I think that it's important for us to remember that everybody's going through something dark and difficult and take the time to reassess what's important to us and to try to support in whatever way we can. It may not be financial. It may be somebody can help promote your work. Somebody, you know, wants to help reshape your organization and make sure it stays a vital organization, provide skills that you don't have. Um, But you're right. I think that if an organization does not come out of this stronger, they're not going to come out at all Mm -hmm. because it means they're not taking advantage of the time to. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, I don't want to tie up much more of your time, and you've been very gracious, really. It's been very informative. Folks like myself who uh, – so I'm just a performer here, um, but we feel very inept. It, it, this is – I don't know what to do. Uh, is there any way – how do people like myself help people like you? If, if we can. Maybe we can't. Maybe we – We just need to sit back and say, okay, we're along for the ride till things open up. But is there anything that we can do to help out here? There's a lot. Uh, I think that performers, and and I am one, that's how I make a living. Oftentimes, uh, actors are waiting for somebody else to do what is needed for them to do their part. So here's your script. Here's your costume. Here's your props. Uh, I think that actors should continue to train. I think actors should continue to study. I think actors should step out of their comfort zone and try to create and try to find ways to uh, work through improvisation, to sit down and maybe try to write. 
to reach out to organizations and say, hey, I'd really like to... Sorry. That's okay. That's my mother calling. Oh, I'll call her mom. Back. I'll call her back. Um, reach out and try to do something more than just act. Don't wait for an opportunity to get in front of an audience. And, and experiment. Explore and play with the technology that you have access to now to do online play readings with other actors, to work on creating characters uh, and putting stuff out there. Obviously, you have to be concerned with intellectual property rights. You don't want to right. put stuff out there and run the risk of copyright infringement and things of that nature. But, you know, reach out to the organizations that you normally would work with and, and ask how you can help. Um, one of the ways things we're going to be doing at Hatbox starting today is I'm going out there to take down the lighting equipment and give it all a good cleaning and hoping to paint the ceiling over the stage navy blue. Well, ain't you quite the domestic. Well, you know. <laughs> using the time well yeah um i want to paint the hallways outside of the bathrooms that's something an actor can do you know if you if you have a place that you like to play whether it's at hatbox or m d productions or the capital center for the arts or wherever you have the opportunity reach out and say hey you know what i have a little time right now i know we're not rehearsing sunday tuesday thursday nights mm -hmm. so how about on sunday tuesday thursday nights i can come and help you clean out that storage room with the props uh, go through the costumes. Uh, there's, there's lots of ways to assist right now that will make, make it much easier to restart. I know one of the biggest challenges I find, and I, I don't know about you, your house looks pretty clean from my perspective, but stuff has a tendency. I have a lady who comes up. in. Oh, there you go. Yeah, no. Yeah, it's I don't, whatever enough. you're paying her, it's not enough. Keep you know, <laughs> Stay in her good graces. She'll, she's going to kill me. We, uh, we have a tendency to just, well, you know, we're not really doing anything, so I can let stuff pile up. I can go outside and garden, I can go whatever. And that's great too. But, you know, sometimes we let the things go because we have a, a break. We forget that just like walking and exercise and eating properly and all that are important. We get out of our normal habits and we have to restart them. And restarting, reobtaining a habit, a good habit that you had once before, is right. always harder once you've gotten out of it. Um, so, you know, again, in the theater world, in the performing arts venues, um, do what you can and, and have, you know, a social distance meetings. We have been running stuff at Hatbox, uh, called our social distance social, which is an invitation only event for small groups to watch television shows or films that are theater specific. Like we watched, uh, Slings and Arrows, the, the Canadian television series. If you haven't watched it Go and watch it. It's really on, all, right. Right now. all right. It was a it was a television series uh, written by Mark McKinney from the Kids in the Hall in Canada about a Canadian Shakespeare festival and uh, the financial problems that they were having and the challenges of the executive side of a business, the business side of show business, wanting to put gift shops in the lobby and sell tchotchkes and have wine tastings and all of that with the artists on the other side who are just there. They don't care about the gift shops. They just want to do the art. And it, it's, it is probably one of my favorite, it is my favorite show that kind of uh, provides a realistic, um, hyper-realistic at times, uh, dramatized version of what it's like to be an actor struggling at a theater that's struggling financially and struggling for audiences and the community of people that builds around it. Half of it is set in the theater bar next door. So, I mean, it's, it's really fascinating to see that. And the, the three seasons, the first season is based on Hamlet. The second season is based on uh, Macbeth. And the final season is on King Lear. And it's not, it's, while we see bits and pieces of Shakespeare performed, they're also always another show that's being rehearsed at the same time. Oh, and so we get to see kind of that interplay. And it's just fun. It's funny. It's outrageous. It was uh, produced in the early 2000s. Uh, and you get to see some amazing actors before they became big. People who are the guy who plays Lenny Bruce in uh, the uh, Mrs. Maisel. Yeah, uh, I haven't seen that part of it. I saw oh, the first season. Yeah, when you get to that, you'll get to see him. He was he played Hamlet. He played a movie star brought to play Hamlet with no stage experience, oh, uh, based on the fact that they can sell tickets. And how a director deals with the fact that he's been told he has to use this cast member. I mean, it's, it's, it, the, the social dynamics of it are fascinating. 
uh, and to play. Realistically, get together and do fun stuff with your theater friends, your yeah. the people and your theater audiences, the people who come and support your work and expose them to other theater related stuff um, that can be done now. Even if we can't gather all together in one room, there are other opportunities. Gotcha. Well, brother, thank you so much for the time. I really, really, really appreciate it. It was a great talk. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I, I'm passionate about this. I, yeah. I've been working really hard and been very excited at developing some great relationships with other artists in other communities. And I, I really am very optimistic that once we grit our teeth and we do what we need to do, wear your masks, wash your hands, and stay at home when you can, observe safety as so we can keep this as as tight as possible until the day arrives when we actually have a, a, a vaccine that will work and we can get back to normal. Right. Um, but I am very optimistic that the relationships that are being built and the love and the energy that's going into uh, the survival work that we're doing is going to reap benefits. But it's really important if you know theater people to remind them how important the work they are is. If you know an artist, remind them how important their work is. If you can hire them during this time to do something, please do so. If you need a mural painted in your home, there are scenic artists out of work. Uh, if you need somebody to do something special as a remote gift, hire a singer to sing a song written or hire a composer to write a song Brilliant. for somebody you love. There's lots of ways that you can support the arts right now in a way that gives you value and gives us value. Um, and if you are in a position to give money, whether to a not-for-profit or to a, you know, an LLC just to keep the doors open, um, to do so because we need the help and, and it, we don't always know how to ask for it. Mm -hmm. So if you think you, if, if something brings you value, step forward and try to give back as you can. Andrew, if somebody wants to reach out to you to help you out, how can they reach you? Uh, you can reach me at hatboxnh.com. Uh, you can reach at, uh, through Andrew at hatboxnh.com. It's a great email address to get to, uh, to me. Um, if you really want to, you can email me through that, or you can even call me. Um, the phone number at the theater is 715-2315. That's uh, 603-715-2315. Or help, I'll give you my cell phone. It's 603 938 Five one five eight. Call me because I'm happy to help. I've been working uh, with lots of other organizations, and if you're struggling, if you have questions, you're not the only one who's struggling and has questions. Mm -hmm. And I might be able to help and connect you up to somebody in your community who can plug you in. Be aware that we are all incredibly busy right now. Even though we're shut down, we're we're busier than ever trying to to survive. And so we may not get back to you right away, but if you don't hear from us right away, don't quit after one call, make another call, make another email, reach out to us and we'll do our, our level best to make sure that you uh, get what you need or if you're trying to help us, that you can help us. And it's Great. greatly appreciated. Dude, you the man. I appreciate you. it, Andrew. I really nice do, to man. See you, Ray. You take care, stay well, and remember, tip your uh, woman who... Uh, <laughs> you are so in trouble oh, i hope she doesn't pay attention to these like my wife doesn't pay attention to i these. owe her dinner now i'll tell you <laughs> all right Love my friend you i can't wait to be uh in person with you again when it's safe to do so i know i know we get to do coffee sometime we got projects to work on we definitely do all right buddy Take care, Ray. bye and there you have it another great one in the tank that one's going off to the memorial Listen, if you really enjoy these podcasts, do us a favor, pass them around, tell your friends about them. If you want to learn more about Square Peg or what we do, you can head out to www.squarepegnh.com or you can find us on Facebook. Have a great day.